could I stop video? Good evening and welcome. It's a pleasure to have speaking to us this evening, Dr. Adana Grandison, who is a very busy registered medical practitioner. She's the host of First Aid Chats by Dr. G, a medical education post podcast, as well as a basic life support instructor at the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Barbados. Dr. Granderson graduated from the University of West Indies, KFL, 
in the year 2016. I was subsequently awarded the Outstanding Intern of the Year Award. She has a strong background in forensic toxicology with both undergraduate and graduate degrees from such area from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. And she was awarded a national award and she was on the Dean's list several occasions. Outstanding alumni. She also volunteers as a medical officer for the Barbados Defense Force Field Medical Facility. And is the first vice president of the Barbados Association of Medical Practitioners, where she sits on the BAMP COVID-19 task force, as well as the National Pharma Vigilance Team. She's an international corresponding member in the National Association of Medical Examiners. And it's a pleasure to welcome, to speak to us on the topic, variants, vaccines and beyond, Dr. Adana Grandison. Before we start, I'd like to start with a short pray during these COVID times. Let us pray. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. In these times of uncertainty and distress, sustain and support the anxious and the fearful. And lift up all who are brought low, that they may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Welcome to all of you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Reverend Bannister, um, at this evening's presentation, COVID variants, vaccines, and beyond. I decided to do this presentation a little different from what has now become the norm um, whenever we do a Zoom presentation, which is to give a PowerPoint. And I thought it would be best really to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, really breaking down what COVID is the vaccine that are available here in Barbados, as well as some of the variants that we have. And in addition to that, then go on to talk about some other matters, for instance, treatment and why we do what we do and what we need to do in order to help us get through this. So as everyone has become quite aware, uh, COVID-19 is the disease associated with the infection of SARS-CoV-2 virus. This uh, virus truly reared its head back in 2019, December 31st, was discovered back in Wuhan, China. And then in early January, 2020, became what we consider a public health concern. Uh, subsequent to that, this virus and infection profile that causes the disease would have been present in several countries. And that gave rise to what we now know as a pandemic. In March of 2020, COVID came to Barbados. So persons may ask, but really what is COVID? And as I said, COVID is a disease profile from the SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS virus. But most importantly, it presents with the following symptoms. And we should know um, that there are some persons who may not have symptoms at all. We consider those persons to be either pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic because they may have no symptoms for the entire duration of their presentation of disease or positivity. And then certainly there are some persons who may have symptoms that include cough, they may have sore throat, headaches, a fever. They may also go on to have shortness of breath. Persons may complain of dizziness, loss of consciousness, or what we know as fainting. And, and so all of these are symptoms that one can have with the virus. 
quite often persons would confuse and say, but how do I really know if this is the COVID, as everyone has now labeled it as the COVID or the vid. Um, and it's simply because the presentation of symptoms is quite similar to that of other respiratory illnesses, quite similar to even the flu. And so it's quite easy to, to confuse um, some of these symptoms. Since the onset of COVID uh, touching the, the globe, we've also noticed some additional symptoms that have presented, including nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And the reason that we tend to get those symptoms is simply when there's an overwhelming response of the virus within the body, the body makes a very valiant attempt to get those virus particles out. And so what we end up having is a quickened transmission of, uh, transition, sorry, of that virus throughout the actual intestinal tract. So I thought that it's important really to understand how COVID operates. So I like to think about COVID as a criminal, and you will hear me reference COVID as a criminal all throughout this presentation, because I think it probably paints the best possible picture. So we have COVID as a criminal um, that essentially has keys to your home. And when you think about your home, one of the fastest ways to gain entry into your home would be via the door, provided that you have keys. On the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 molecule, we have what we know as spike proteins. Now these spike proteins are very, very important. And we will talk about these spike proteins in a bit greater detail when we get onto variants. But these spike proteins essentially function as the key to enter your home or your cells, okay? Gain entry and allow for the virus to replicate or multiply, make more copies of itself. The virus is unable to make copies of itself on its own. And it really, really requires the help of the human body. And so that is why it's important for us to certainly disrupt the link, disrupt the spread and cause a decrease in the amount of transmission that we can have with COVID. Certainly when we, when we think about this home and this key, there are some things that one may get concerned about. Now we often hear about the non-pharmacologic measures that persons can implement even before we had the vaccines available. These include hand washing because we know these are our greatest travelers. And so we can certainly have huge uh, amounts of bacteria or viral content on our hands, which can then go into the various, what we call orifices or ports of entry for this virus. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about your eyes, your nose and your mouth. Now, which brings us to our third non-pharmacological intervention, which is known as proper mass wearing. And I stress on the proper because I think it is quite important. But how do we wear a mask properly? We have quite often seen persons putting on the mask and surfing them under the chin, almost like how we know that some guys wear their pants quite low, also quite ineffective. Or we see sometimes persons with their mask partially placed on their face with the nose out. But I will let you know that it is very, very important to wear your mask properly. But most important is how do you even go about putting on your mask and what are the steps that you should do to check your mask properly? So the first thing is that when you get your mask, whether it's a surgical mask like this one, this is what we call our surgical mask. I'll actually take off my, my background so that you can see the surgical mask quite nicely. Just give me one quick second. Okay. So when we talk about the surgical mask, we're talking about the mask that allows for the person to have the blue component to the front and it's usually white in the back. So the first thing you have to do is check your mask. Ensure there are no tears in your mask, there are no breaches in your mask, there are no holes in your mask. Quite often persons will from time to time, I have seen it, 
have the mask actually tied in the corner because it has popped. And they said, well, let me get two more wear ends out of it. And they go on to actually attempt to put the mask on their face. And I will tell you that you need to have the blue part of the mask to the outside, and then certainly the white part towards your face. And this is how you put it on. So you ensure that the mask nicely loops around your ears. It's not supposed to be worn down here. It's not supposed to be worn here at the tip of your nose, but you wanna make sure that it covers quite nicely on top of your nose and it comes under your chin. You don't pinch the top of the mask, but you actually attempt to smooth the mask over your nose so that you're getting a good snug fit. Quite often, persons will say, well, I can see down through the sides of my mask. And generally speaking, you don't want that you can see down through you. If you look at some persons, you can see their lips, you can see their cheeks, and that's not how you want your mask to be fitting you. But also, we tend to find some persons going like this and twisting the mask. Now, if you look here now, we have a huge pocket in the side of the mask, and that also is not what we want. So we want to ensure that the mask is fitting you properly. So that's your surgical mask. If you're in the profession or you're in an, in an area which will essentially have either high concentrations of the virus or you are undertaking an aerosolizing procedure, then we recommend using the N95 or the KN95 mask. And again, you want to examine your mask properly, ensure that there are no breaches in your mask, and you go ahead and you put on your mask. Now, there are times that as you put on your mask, the ear straps may pop. And you want to make sure that if that happens, you go back and you change out your mask. Again, ensuring that you have a snug fit. You can test your KN95 by putting your hand above, blowing at the sides and under the bottom. If you're feeling any air coming from under your mask, then you don't have the right fit for your mask. And so it's important that you always have the right fit for your mask. So I'm going to go on. So we're going to talk about the non-pharmacological interventions, which is your hand washing, your proper mask wearing, and most importantly, your physical distance. It is known that generally speaking, this virus tends to travel in droplets. And those droplets can travel once the area is not um, with a high ventilation rate, generally tend to travel about six or so feet. And so that is why we recommend that person stand beyond the six foot mark to allow some of those bigger, what we used to call growing up in school, we talk about golf balls. And you know, if you're standing close to someone, those golf balls are, are, are saliva droplets can essentially hit you. And so you wanna get to a distance where all of those saliva droplets are essentially falling to the ground. Okay, now as they fall to the ground, they allow for less virus particles to get to you. And so with only, not we're not even talking about the vaccines yet, with only the non-pharmacological interventions, you have a very good chance of protecting yourself once you are ensuring that you're doing it every single time. Now then we have the variants that came into the space. We know that there are several variants that, what, that came into the space since the onset of what we now call wild type COVID or the original strain of COVID that presented back when this pandemic started. Now I should let you know, there are several mutations out there of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but all of them are not of what we call clinical significance. So you can have different changes in the backbone or the structure of the virus, but all of them may not cause any noticeable difference in terms of how they affect us. And so we're not too concerned from a medical standpoint of those mutations. However, we are very concerned about virus particles that certainly can go on to cause clinical significance in terms of mutations. So for instance, if we have a virus that has mutated or changed, and I'll go back to the criminal. If the first time you saw this criminal, this criminal was wearing a black hat, a red shirt, and a black pants, you would probably recognize him each and every time you saw him. Now, in an attempt to try to get past without recognition, 
criminal might decide, well, I'm going to take off my hat or I might shave my beard or I might dye my hair color or something of the sort just to get past you. And so it then becomes very, very difficult for you to identify this criminal as a criminal and the criminal can go on to do what it needs to do in terms of committing a crime. When we have variants in the space, variants are either a concern for us clinically based upon the transmissibility of the actual virus. So that is the ability of the virus to pass from one person to another. And we've seen this here being the greatest concern as we now have Delta in the space where Delta has increased transmissibility. When this virus came, first came and made its way on the world stage, we knew that each person could essentially infect approximately two persons. Now Delta has the ability, if a person is infected with Delta, it has the ability to infect about eight to nine persons from every single person that's infected. And I'll tell you what, the Delta virus going back to that key, essentially, which is a spike protein, it essentially has a flexible spike protein. And so instead of your key being only to fit one door, you almost have a master key now that can essentially flex a bit. All of the notches on the key are good for two or three or four locks around your house. And you can use that one key for multiple locks to get gain entry into the house quickly. Okay, and that's essentially what the Delta mutation allows for. And so we have the Delta mutation in the space. We also have the Alpha mutation in the space in terms of variants of concern. We have the Beta mutation, the Gamma mutation as well. But prior to a variant being considered a variant of concern, we may not know exactly how it works, but we may see lots of persons presenting with the mutation in the space. And so we term those variants, variants of interest until we get to know a little bit more about them. So we have epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, iota, kappa, and lambda. But what I should allow you to know is that there is a second part of the variant that is con of concern. If it is not highly transmissible, then the variant can also do a few other things, which is it can evade the vaccine, what we call vaccine escape, or what we call breakthrough cases, where in as much as a person may be vaccinated, a person can still get ill from the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus. And those are essentially how the variants operate. Because remember, anytime that you have a virus, the virus in circulation, the virus's sole job is to live, to live at all costs, to live at all costs, even if it means hurting you, it's vector, okay? And so persons who may get infected with this virus, because generally the virus tends to go into the nose and it is kept essentially as a reservoir in the back of the nose, what we term as the nasopharynx, that is exactly where, and that is why we swab here in Barbados into the nasopharynx but we have a reservoir of the virus that essentially collects in the back of the nose, in the nasopharynx, and the virus starts to enter our cells via the ACE2 receptor. And it starts to replicate, it starts to multiply. Now, our job really is to ensure that the virus does not get the opportunity to replicate to the point where it overtakes our body or takes over control. Our body becomes too overwhelmed. But I want you to think about this criminal that I told you about. So this criminal essentially has been captured and he's been brought in by the police for questioning. Most criminals would say, I'm not talking. I'm not saying a word. They want me, they say they have me, they have a crime for me, prove it. And so this criminal is sitting quite quietly, not giving any information at all to the body to gain identity of this criminal, but what does a police officer do? And the police officers within our system is really the white blood cells or what we know as a bigger group, our immune system. And so this immune system essentially is there to 
first of all, recognize that there's something that's there that's foreign, and then go on after recognizing and identifying what that foreign entity is, attempting to kill it, get it out of circulation. So we have this criminal come in to, he came into the police station, essentially, and the police is asking him a few questions, he's not answering. Police say, okay, no problem. I'll take some fingerprints, I'm gonna take a mug shot, I'm gonna upload all of this information into the database, and I'm gonna try to find out the identity of this criminal. That's essentially what your immune system is doing. And you have two arms of your immune system. You have the innate immune system, and you have the adaptive immune system. Now, think about the innate immune system as the first set of what we would call your local police officers, or your, your uh, state, your county, or local uh, troopers that you may have. And they're there to capture the criminals, bring them in for processing. And they sort of do a bit of killing off, trying to assist with uh, helping to reduce any possible other issues that they may have. So you've put all of this information in his database and the body's processing it, trying to figure out who is this criminal in circulation. Now this process generally takes about four to seven days in the normal person with a normal functioning immune system. And then after it has passed all that information through the database, it's checked Interpol, it's checked all these various places, it goes, aha, I now know who this criminal is and I now know how to kill it. And so you can either then get special ops or SWAT, or here we have task force to come in and have a very strategic attack in terms of how to get rid of this criminal. And that's your adaptive immune system where you then have specialized cells that come in that not only kill the actual virus or any non-self particle that's in circulation, but it also stores a copy. So it, the picture that you initially took when you were trying to figure out exactly who this criminal is, it takes that picture and it stores a copy of that picture up on the message board so that everybody knows who this criminal is. So that the next time, if this criminal is ever seen, we get rid of it. So that's how your immune system works, a well-functioning immune system. And there's certainly no harm in making sure that you eat properly, get lots of rest, exercise, take your vitamins. But remember that the immune system still has to go through that sorting process. Now, this is where the benefit of vaccines come in because the vaccine is really to prime the immune system so that we can recognize who this criminal is quickly. So the same way you would have submitted that picture and the fingerprints into a database to cross-reference so you can get a quick answer to who that criminal is, your vaccine is doing just that. Here in Barbados, we have three vaccines available. We have the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is the first vaccine that came on, came into Barbados for us to use. And this vaccine can be used by anyone who is essentially over the age of 18 years. What this vaccine, how this vaccine has been made is essentially to place some of the viral content that is not live, uh, within another virus shell. So if we take think of the virus as essentially uh, chocolates, and we think about the adenovirus, which is the viral vector that we speak about, as um, a big ball that has, um, at this point in time, nothing on it. We take that, and that viral vector is essentially placed into the arm, and the body starts to recognize, hmm, something here is not right. And that outer covering essentially breaks down and the body gets access to the viral content. And the viral content actually makes copies for the same spike protein, the key. So that when any cell presents with now a ball with sprinkles, which we can see as the key or, or the essential entry point for the virus, what it will do is that it will say, okay, I recognize these sprinkles. We actually had to kill some of these sprinkles last week and it gets rid of the sprinkles quite quickly. So again, priming your immune system. The second vaccine which came to Barbados was a Sinopharm vaccine. And how that is essentially made is that they, take, they took three copies of persons who were infected 
with SARS-CoV-2 very early from in Wuhan, China, and essentially looked at the different variations of how their particles or virus particles looked and put them together, inactivated them as well because it's not live, and essentially inoculated persons to see how it is that they will mount a response. So this is now the virus in all its glory, but it's not alive, okay? And there are three different variants that you can have of it within the actual single vaccine. That's Sinopharm. Now we have then the Pfizer vaccine. A lot of persons get very, very, very concerned about the Pfizer vaccine. Why? Because it's new. We've never heard about this technology, but I wanna reassure you today that mRNA vaccines have been around and we've been working on them for quite some time. It's not just since 2019. I will go as far as to say that in terms of SARS-CoV-1, which we know as the original SARS virus, persons have been looking at this from since 2012, okay? Now with the advances in technology, the beautiful thing about science now is that we can look at a virus using the technology that we have, for instance, genomic sequencers, and it essentially tells us every single thing that makes up the backbone of the virus. Just like how right now, we know what is the sequence of the human genome. And so that's the beauty about having technology that has advanced. And so they were able to say, okay, well, here's the backbone of the original SARS virus. Let's see how this here changes um, and what difference we have here versus SARS-1 versus SARS-CoV-2. And when they looked at the backbone, they said, okay, well, here is probably what is responsible for this spike protein. We know that this is what is specifically responsible for that key. And so they took the component of the genome that is responsible for the key, and they essentially placed it into a coating of what we know as fat. And that is what everyone is very concerned about when they hear about the lipid nanoparticle. But why did they use fat as a lipid nanoparticle? Well, here, within our body, we know that we have lots of cells that have what we call a lipid that actually are arranged in what we know as a lipid bilayer. And that allows for the easy passage or carriage of material from one side to the other side of a cell, from outside to inside of a cell. Okay, and so the best way to essentially get all of that information to where we can use that, again, only spike protein, so it's not the full virus, so that the body can be primed to know what to look out for, is to package it in a fat particle, a nanoparticle that would easily be transmitted across from outside to inside the cell, and it stays in the cytoplasm, so it does not go in to the nucleus of the cell. And why is this important? Persons are concerned that the, the Pfizer vaccines, the Moderna vaccines, et cetera, can certainly go into the nucleus of the cell and it can cause changes within your cell. It can cause changes within your genome, but the actual RNA doesn't go into your nucleus. And so what the body does is that it recognizes this RNA, the body starts to actually make complementing DNA from it, and then essentially, again, we start to release some of these essential spike proteins into circulation. The body goes, I don't know you, I'm gonna kill you. And I'm gonna take a picture of what I kill and I'm gonna show off to all of my friends. So that in the event that the real virus that comes in very red, very angry with some sprinkles on the outside or that criminal that's dressed in the, the cap with the red shirt and the black jeans walks into the space, we go, I know who that is. I'm gonna take it out, I'm gonna kill it immediately. And so that is why it's so important to have something like a vaccine because the vaccine is there to prime the immune system so that the processing of what this foreign entity is does not take that long. Because remember, I told you, the virus's sole job is to survive, to survive, to replicate at all costs, no matter what happens to you. And so, as you are sorting, the virus is replicating, making more and more copies of itself. And with more and more copies, you now have the possibility of your body becoming overwhelmed. And how do you become overwhelmed? How do you know you're becoming overwhelmed? You start to get symptoms. 
you start to initially have symptoms like upper respiratory tract symptoms. So you have sometimes the congestion, you may have a headache, you may feel sometimes a little snotty, and then you're going to have no respiratory tract symptoms. And that's now where the virus is essentially being transmitted down the back of the nasopharynx and into the oropharynx, which is the back of the nose and the back of the mouth, and it's heading down towards the lungs, which is where the virus actually causes the most of its damage. And within the lungs, we know that we have lots of ACE receptors down there. And essentially, the body goes on to cause what we have usually call a pneumonia. But is it a pneumonia that just affects one part of the lungs, a single part of the lungs? No, it affects the entire lungs. And so that is what makes it very, very difficult for a person to breathe. Our lungs are responsible for moving oxygen in, getting carbon dioxide out. And in order to do that quite quickly, because it happens with every single breath you take. I mean, think about how many breaths you take without even really recognizing that you're taking lots of breaths. This process has to happen really quickly to essentially get all the oxygen in within a breath, get that oxygen all around the body, take up all of the carbon dioxide and get the carbon dioxide out in time for you to exhale. An amazingly fast process. And this here happens quite easily. Now, if you have lots of gunk and mucus and all of those things that are done in the lungs along with a lot more of that infectious material, what essentially happens is that it slows that process. So the supply to demand is now mismatched. You are no longer getting enough oxygen in and enough carbon dioxide out because everything has been slowed down. That distance to actually get that oxygen and carbon dioxide moving has completely slowed down. And persons will experience this here as feeling quite short of breath, okay? They will complain of saying, Doc, I don't feel as if I can breathe very well. And that is why we actually use things like pulse oximeters, where you put on a probe on the finger to try to measure the amount of oxygen indirectly that a person may have, or we may use more direct measures to actually check the oxygenation of the blood. Now let's go on now to essentially, how does this criminal either get away or how can you assist yourself by getting a vaccine? So we have this criminal, it's all dressed up, it's essentially gone, come through the airport at the level of Grantley Adams International Airport, let's take that for a nice example. And you've seen some, you've seen this person, you say, hmm, he looks very strange or she looks very strange, I'm not so sure. There's something you, some hunch that you're getting in your tummy. And that's essentially what the body does. It recognizes something that isn't itself and it goes, hmm, not so sure about you. Without the vaccine, again, as I said, you take lots of time to get that actual virus, recognize that virus so that you can kill it. With the vaccine, you have the Interpol help desk, you have everyone else. Now, remember that this virus is a criminal. Its job is to essentially come into a space and get rid of you essentially because it's virus versus you. So you have this virus, he's now cleared airport and he's come out and I try to see this virus almost like a serial killer. And that's really what it is. It's taking lots of lives all over the world. And this serial killer is very methodical in what it does. It gets up every morning at the same time, eats breakfast at the same time. Almost every single morning, probably eating the same breakfast, okay? And he sets about his job to watch you, to see your every move, to essentially know your habits. So that if I get to learn your habits, I know exactly how to strike. Now, generally speaking, the average human is not that methodical. The average human is not usually focused and, and as rigid as that every single day. Generally, we have off days. You might get up a little late one morning. We may not have breakfast as we should a morning. And so with that flexibility that we generally tend to have in our, our life, there's always the possibility where we lose, and put down, essentially drop our guard. So this criminal is watching you and it says, you know what? I, I like to use myself as an example. Adana gets up every morning at a certain time. She has breakfast, she goes, she has a shower, she gets ready for work, and she's probably going to take the highway to go to work. So I know that if I wanted to attack Adana, I could probably go the highway. Okay, cool. 
So the virus sits down, it's parked in the car and it's waiting for me to come to a lonely road where I come, have to come to a, a stop before I move off. And you see this, this person essentially looking at you quite strange at this junction, but you're not really too sure, but can't really do anything about it because you don't really recognize who this criminal is, but you have your suspicions. And this person comes up to you, or comes up to me rather, and attempts to stab me, let's say assault me, okay? And I, I attempt to fight him off and I, I get along my way. I recognize that this is a criminal. I try to essentially defend myself, but I get away. I'm hurt, he's hurt, but I get away. Now he comes home and essentially he, he tries to stitch up himself. He's not going to any hospital because he doesn't want to go on record. He comes home, he stitches up himself. You know, I've filed a complaint, but this criminal has gone into thin air. We don't know who this criminal is. And approximately a week later, I'm driving on the same road and I see this criminal. And I said, uh-huh, you know what? This time I know who you are though. And if you come towards my car, I am going to hurt you. I'm going to defend myself. But I attempt to stab this criminal the same place that I stabbed him before. Now, this criminal has said, hmm, she got me the first time. So instead of me putting on no protection, I think I'm going to put on some extra protection around my midsection where she stabbed me the last time. I'm going to put on a bulletproof vest. I'm going to put on a helmet. All of this is protection so that virus survives, but the virus can hurt me. And he comes up to my car the same way and he's not attempting to hurt me. And I say, I know you. And I stab at him. But when I stab at him, he has extra padding and protection around his waist. So do I hurt him? Nope. Nope. I think that if it is I attempt to stab him, I'm hurting him, I'm doing nothing. And the virus goes, aha, uh -huh, but now you don't have that protection. Now, your vaccine really works as your cape of protection. It helps you out in those moments that you may not be able to act quickly, that you may not be able to, to defend yourself. So it's, for instance, the partronics that you have on your car that tell you someone is coming close. It's the bulletproof vest that police officers wear. It's that additional layer of protection that you have. And so this is why we encourage persons not simply to vaccinate because vaccination is not the answer to it all, but certainly to have the vaccination and also ensure to maintain those non-pharmacologic measures that we've asked you to do. And I'm now going to say to you that certainly there are some persons who will ask the question, but doc, why get vaccinated when, for instance, persons that have been vaccinated can get ill? And I'll tell you why. So you have some person who's been vaccinated. And remember, the reason for the vaccine is to prime your immune system. But how do you prime your immune system? With a vaccine. Good. So you've, you've gotten vaccinated. You've gotten infected because remember, this vaccine goes in your arm, which mounts us an IgG response, which is really to protect our lungs, to prevent severe illness, to prevent severe disease, to prevent death from occurring just by the manner in which I told you about earlier. But then we have another response that happens at the level of the nose, which is the IgA response. Our vaccines are not covering for this. The only vaccine that we have, not for COVID though, is a seasonal flu vaccine, in, a seasonal flu inoculation, which is really something that you essentially sniff up your nose that gives you protection at the level of IgA as well as IgG. But we don't have that with SARS-CoV as yet because those vaccines are a lot more difficult to manufacture. So yes, if you do get exposed, someone sneezes on you, someone coughs on you, someone sings and you're in the presence of someone who has the virus, Yes, those virus particles are going to go in if you don't use your non-pharmacological measures. You are going to inhale those virus particles. They are going to get to the back of your nose. But what happens after they get into the back of your nose? So remember, the vaccine is there to prime. So they are going to replicate. And within four days, what research has shown is that we actually start to see the levels of virus dropping off because our immune system is able to pick up that criminal a lot earlier, which means that it gets it out of circulation a lot earlier. In the unvaccinated person, however, when the virus gets in, it's there, it's replicating, it's saying, okay, let's continue to party, guys. They don't recognize us, they're there trying to find out who we are, but they can't. So we're gonna continue to work while they sleep. 
while they wait to come into work the next day, while they waste time. And they continue to replicate until our immune system is overwhelmed. And that's why it's important to get vaccinated. Because even with the vaccine, even if you got exposed, even if you tested positive, the likelihood of you going on to get the severe symptoms, the symptoms that require hospitalization are decreased because your immune, uh, your, your virus levels decrease after four days because your immune system gets into act a lot quicker. Okay, so we've had the vaccine, we've had the variants, and now what is beyond? So there's lots of talk about but am I going to have to use this vaccine? Is this vaccine really going to work? We have found that there are a few persons who have what we call breakthrough cases or breakthrough disease profiles. But really, what is breakthrough? So essentially, breakthrough is when a person has taken the full course of a vaccine. So for instance, both all the AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Sinopharm, all of them, are two dose regimes, whereas for instance, Johnson & Johnson is a single dose, but a person who tests positive after 14 days of receiving that vaccine. Because immediately after you get the vaccine, you have not mounted the sufficient immune response. It takes about 14 days for you to be fully protected against the virus. Uh, and I should say fully, when I, when I say fully, in accordance with what the research has said, because we know that we do not get 100% coverage from the vaccine, okay? So in terms of us getting the requisite amount of coverage that protects us, that tends to happen after 14 days of inoculation with your second dose of your vaccine. Now, any person who gets symptoms and has a positive result after the 14 days, we consider them to be a breakthrough case. But what have we seen with those breakthrough cases? We've seen that those persons generally don't get ill. They generally don't require hospitalization. Actually, one of the studies has shown that four out of every thousand persons who've actually been vaccinated will have a breakthrough infection that can potentially result in death that can potentially result in hospitalization. And that one out of every thousand persons can have a breakthrough infection that can result in death. Versus what we are seeing with the unvaccinated population, where we know that approximately 70% of those persons will not have what we call severe disease, but the other 30% will go on to have presentation of disease that will result in hospitalization. And then we know that a small subset of one in probably every hundred, sometimes even less now that we're looking at Delta, can then go on to have very significant outcomes. And these are significant negative outcomes, which can result in death. So I just wanted to take a pause here because I know that there are some persons who have been asking questions. I'm gonna take a question. Um, I am seeing one that was posted to me privately um, asking essentially about the, the different vaccines. And I hope that I've answered that question for you, but I am going to take this opportunity to answer any questions that you may have. Um, also, I should let you know in terms of the treatment, what are the treatment options out there? How does uh, this treatment essentially work for persons? So we have things like steroid treatment that, that we have available. And these are treatment is generally used for persons who are essentially extremely symptomatic or not doing well. And it is really an attempt to assist that person in, in getting the body to a point where it can function and not become overwhelmed. We also know that remdesivir has been used and it has been used quite widely. Um, we've had uh, regional studies that have been done, but Gilead, the actual company that actually makes remdesivir, will actually be presenting its data because they are showing now that persons who have taken remdesivir have actually had improved outcomes. And this is actually part of one of the protocols that, for instance, Mayo Clinic in the United States of America, they actually recommend remdesivir as one of the things that can be used to improve the outcomes of persons, especially persons who have severe disease, to try to reduce the possibility of 
mortality and morbidity. But we have treatment options that are available. So remember, with a virus, it's not like a bacteria. We don't use antibacterial medication or what we call antibiotics. But we actually, for most viruses, we either treat symptomatically or we can use antiviral medication. Sometimes we may use a bit of steroids to assist when the immune system becomes too overwhelmed. Or what we can use is some of the other newer modalities like the monoclonal antibodies, which we don't have here. Okay, so in terms of what, why is it important really for us to, to take these measures, vaccination, as well as the non-pharmaceuticals, everyone, or non-pharmacological, everyone wants to get back to what we know as a relatively normal life. Because we have been essentially affected internationally, locally, by this pandemic, it has affected the healthcare system. It has affected the economic stability of our country. It has affected so many different things for us. And every single time, essentially, that there is disruption, we have a setback. And with that setback, then comes the mental component, the psychosocial burden, the distressor, where persons may feel quite overwhelmed when we actually have these effects every single time. Think about when, for instance, you may have some person within your workspace, within your house space that becomes infected or test positive. How does that really affect your life? Does it make you feel scared? Does it essentially cause you to have decreased productivity for at least a few days? Because at the very least you're going to quarantine and that's at least five days disruption. And can we afford to have at the very least five days disruption of our lives? Um, a lot of persons will tell you, no, they can't do that. And so that's why it's quite important for us to try to be very, very, very careful when we are dealing with the virus and the vaccine. I, I want for persons to, to feel comfortable that if they don't know what they should do, or they're unsure about what measures they should take, that they should essentially reach out to their doctor and ask a question. And I'm seeing a hand, one hand up. Now I'm gonna to ask to unmute. Go ahead. Hello, Doc, good, good evening. Um, I'd like you to you to speak to the issue of um, there, 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 there's there's a, a a trend a trend of thought that what is the sense of getting a vaccine when the vaccine doesn't stop you from getting COVID and and persons go on by that reasoning to to further say. Um, if I get the vaccine, is the same thing as if I don't get the vaccine. But from the from the information that I have seen, there seems to be an issue where those persons who are unvaccinated that go on to um, be impacted by COVID nineteen end up getting more severe disease, which can then have further long-term health challenges. And I, I think that quite a few persons look past that after COVID, there is still reason to be concerned because you, you, you can have, you can get over the, the initial sickness, but still the virus would have done some damage to the body function in different ways that is long-term in nature. Whereas with vaccinated persons, the, 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 the nature of disease tends, based on the information seen, tends to be less severe or almost non-existent. Could you talk to that? Sure, so you just brought up a very good point, which is the concern certainly of what we call long COVID. Um, long COVID certainly is quite a concern. So just for those of you who don't know what long COVID is, this is persons who will present 
with symptoms. So you've become symptomatic and you continue to have symptoms even after 12 weeks. And we found that persons who have become symptomatic, generally we tend to see that in the unvaccinated population when they do, those who could get infected, who may be unvaccinated, who then become symptomatic, that percentage of persons who become symptomatic. We found that what can happen is that they don't resolve their symptoms as nicely as they should. And what can happen is that they can go on to develop several symptoms. What are some of these symptoms that we talk about? We found that several persons have become extremely tired. They've complained of joint and muscle aches. Certainly the loss or the change in taste and smell persists. And one of the most common things that persons will tell you that they've been experiencing is problems with memory and concentration, what we call brain fog. But in addition to that, there are also some physiological changes that occur. We have persons who get shortness of breath. They now experience uh, heart palpitations. They're now getting persistent chest pain. Persons actually can potentially require oxygen while they, they continue to live. So overall, the quality of life significantly changes. We have even seen persons who have even have what we call intestinal or bladder problem. And there is no true understanding of what exactly is happening when long COVID occurs, but it is thought that long COVID essentially occurs as a result of the immune system going into overdrive and now not only attacking the virus particles or the virus cells that it sees, but now also attacking itself because it is essentially to the point where there are too many criminals in the space. I can't just hire a sharpshooter, shoot one down and get rid of that criminal. But there's so many criminals in the space that I now have to just essentially start to spray the entire area. Do I hurt people who are not criminals? Of course I do. And, and that is not really what we want. So you don't want that the immune system is essentially overwhelmed to the point where not only it attacks a foreign entity, which would be the virus particles, but it also then goes on to attack uh, itself. I hope I've answered your question. Any other questions? So, okay, so let me just check. Okay, so I'm also seeing another question here. If you can also speak about the efficacy rate in each of the vaccines. So yes, so one of the things that we have noticed in terms of the vaccine, everyone speaks of the efficacy rate of the actual vaccine. And certainly when we look at the three vaccines that we have here, their efficacy rate is a bit different. Okay, and, and so when we, we have to look at first thing, uh, essentially what is its efficacy after the first dose? And then what is the efficacy essentially after um, the second dose, the full dosage that we have? Okay, now when we talk about, for instance, the Pfizer vaccine, we tend to get approximately 95% efficacy after the complete course, which is the second dose of the vaccine. When we look at uh, Oxford AstraZeneca, which is a bit different in terms of the technology that was used, because the, the Oxford AstraZeneca is in keeping more with older technology that we're accustomed to seeing here on the island, we get approximately up to 90 to 92% in terms of its efficacy. And then certainly uh, the efficacy for Sinopharm is a little lower in the 80%. But remember that for a vaccine to be considered effective, you just need to have over 50 to 60% efficacy for that vaccine to be considered effective. And, and so these vaccines are all efficacious. They all work. They all protect you against severe response or severe outcomes from the disease. Okay, I'm seeing another question here. 
Is remdesivir used in Barbados when the WHO are against it, but the FDA approved its first use in October 2020? So, so just remember that, yes, uh, there are different medications that are used. I actually don't work at um, Harson Point. So at this point in time, I can't say definitively um, that remdesivir is used in Barbados. Um, but what I can say is that remdesivir has actually been shown to work. Now, there are some concerns in terms of this medication, if it can cause damage to, uh, for instance, the kidneys, which is one of the organs that is required to eliminate the virus. Um, and if I will say this to you, that if it is that a person, for instance, is taking any medication, not just remdesivir, remember that a doctor's duty to a patient requires firstly to keep you safe. Okay, so while you're taking medication, while you're getting treatment, doctors are monitoring you. They're monitoring what your outcomes are. They're monitoring how much, for instance, how much urine you're putting out. They're, they want to know how your organs are functioning. Is the body responding well to this medication? Is In terms of, is the viral load going down? Are the kidneys getting worse? Are they improving? Uh, is the liver being impaired? And we take off lots of blood work. Um, sometimes daily, sometimes every other day, depend upon what we're looking for to ensure that you remain safe. But it's not that these medications will be given to someone and they will essentially be left out in the lurch with, with no assistance. So that is really not one of the tenets of, of medical care. We are there to, to assist you, to provide care, to provide treatment where treatment can be used and also to ensure safety because one of our pillars is really to do no harm, right? So we give you medication, we explain to you why you're getting the medication, what is the indication for the medication, what is the benefit of the medication, and we also tell you what are the risks because anything that you can take or do in the world of medicine has benefits and it has risks. And generally, as doctors, we will recommend or suggest certain interventions once the benefit outweighs the risk. And once that benefit outweighs the risk, then we continue to monitor to see if that is still the case or if anything should change along the way. Have any other questions? Okay, I'm seeing another question here. I have another question, Doc. Okay. Um, and this this relates to vaccine mandate and and who pays for the cost of keeping our society safe. Now, the government of Barbados have actually provided free of cost for citizens to have to be vaccinated. And this is in an effort to keep the population safe, to seek to restore a measure of safety in the workplace so that economic activity can take place. You can go to the supermarket without being impaired and so on. And, um, and, but there are those who believe I don't need to take that. And, and, and some people have a genuine case for not wanting to be vaccinated because they might have underlying issues that might mitigate against taking the vaccine. But there are those who just don't want to take it because they are anti the vaccine for whatever reason. Shouldn't, and I, I know there's a, a big debate going on about mandating vaccination. And I know governments tend to be a little hesitant about mandating vaccines, but if not mandating the vaccine, shouldn't individuals bear their own costs of keeping themselves safe. 
Okay, so so I will say that there there is a strong push really to for persons to be vaccinated. I do apologize for my dogs in the back. Uh, for persons to be vaccinated, um, but there needs to be a legislative framework if something is going to be mandated, right? Yes, we always, from a medical standpoint, we always want to strongly suggest, recommend, emphasize benefits versus risks. But our job is also to uh, allow our, our, essentially have a patient the ability to exercise their own autonomy. All right. Now, in a public health uh, situation, there are some things that are for the greater good. So, for instance, if if we don't have a vaccine mandate, I would strongly suggest that there is something that we really, really need to do, which is to normalize frequent testing. Um, certainly, uh, this is a recommendation that as BAP, BAP has certainly made. Um, where we recommend the normalization of, of persons knowing their status, um, of us knowing uh, where our community stands as a whole. And so it's quite important not, not only now to know if you have COVID or not, because we now have variants within society, but more importantly to know exactly what we have here. And so I know that there are a lot of persons who get quite concerned saying, well, I don't want to go and know because then they can come for me and I can go down the bus. Like what well, all of the horror stories that a lot of persons hear, which is quite unfortunate because we are one of the few, we have one of the few facilities in the world where we essentially have a dedicated facility to assist people early. Um, generally speaking, in a lot of the other international spaces, persons get sick, they're told to stay at home, symptoms may develop, they may or may not be able to access healthcare, and, and essentially they don't get the, the best possible care that they probably should have at the correct time, intervening quite early. That's not what we have here. We actually have a dedicated facility, and I, don't, I think it's quite unfortunate that persons sort of see it as a detention center, but it really isn't that. It's because we recognize that persons can move from asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic to becoming symptomatic and then becoming severely symptomatic quite quickly. And so we want to be there to intervene where we can assist you at the earliest possible time to give you the best possible outcome. But in terms of who should bear that cost, well, we when it comes to to Barbadians at the end of the day, whether you are bearing it for yourself or we are collectively bearing it as taxpayers, we're still bearing the cost. So there is a significant need for us to try to do what needs to be done so that we can get back to a new normal. So someone has asked here in the chat, um, good evening, can you talk about vaccinations for persons who have had COVID? Okay, so that's a very good question. So in terms of a person who has had COVID, we want to first of all make sure that you don't have any more symptoms and you have been cleared from a medical standpoint. So you've been cleared from isolation, you've met criteria to be discharged. But after that, you're given approximately three months, 90 days before you can be vaccinated. And the reason that we want to give you that time is because we know that you should have, should, I know I'm saying should because there are two types of antibodies that we generally tend to have. We tend to have binding antibodies, which essentially try to junk up on the actual um, spike protein. And then we also have, for instance, neutralizing antibodies. Now, neutralizing mm -hmm. antibodies are the ones that we really want, the ones that see the virus and go, Phew, take it out of circulation one time, right? Um, but we want to make sure that the immune system is not hyped, is not peaked, is not angry, is not aggressive, is not attacking. Um, so we want to make sure that your immune system has sort of settled down a bit and then for you to be immunized. Remember the role of a vaccine is just to peak your immune system so that it's aware that if something comes in the space to act. Now, if you have an immune system that's essentially overactive, again, it's not just now only attacking watch. It's not supposed to be there, but then it, there's a possibility that it can attack yourself. 
Also, can you please explain a bit about false positives and false negative results? Absolutely. So when we think about testing here in Barbados, you hear about two types of tests being used currently. Everyone hears about the PCR test and the rapid test. But I want to let you know there are two different types of rapid tests. So here we use currently a rapid antigen test. So I'll start with that. So rapid antigen test is to be used in a person essentially who is either based upon their travel requirement, um, has been approved to, to use a rapid antigen test. For instance, travel to the UK or travel to um, the United States of America, not recommended for travel to Canada. The other time that we use um, a rapid antigen test is certainly for a person who may be displaying symptoms. And why can we use a rapid antigen test? How does the rapid antigen test work? So the rapid antigen test is essentially working by taking the same sample from where the virus collects in the back of the nose, in the nasopharynx, and that is where we tend to get the best accumulation of the virus. So that's why we have opted not for the anterior nose or the mid-nasal, we've gone right to the back. But essentially, that's where you get the best sample collection. And you take a swab and you place that swab into a buffer that essentially stabilizes it and allows for it to go on what looks like the equivalent of a, a pregnancy test, a home pregnancy test. Now, how does this here work? This kit is essentially looking for some of the markers that will be able to tell you with scientific certainty this is SARS-CoV-2. It's a screening test. It's not a confirmation test. So generally speaking, persons who have very high viral load in circulation can get and should get a positive result. Okay. Now, the biggest concern with this test is that there are persons who will take this test who will get what we call a false negative. What is a false negative? So generally speaking, within the first few days of a person getting infected, they don't have enough virus particles to essentially give what you would call a low CT value. And I explain CT value when we go into PCR, but this low CT value. And so that person, when the sample actually is run, you don't get a positive result. So you go ahead feeling, huh, I'm good. I don't have COVID. But a false negative test is a false comfort to have. And so what we do is that we generally would give a person a rapid antigen test followed by a PCR test, okay? The PCR test is the gold standard for testing for the presence of SARS-CoV-2. And again, this particular test not only does it have the specific markers within the actual buffers and, and stuff like that to state that this is SARS-CoV-2 because it's binding with certain components within the actual uh, molecule, but most importantly, it does something very interesting. This test allows for a series of hot or heating and cooling cycles. So we ramp up the temperature on the sample, we cool it down, ramp it up and we cool it down. And we send it through all of those processes with the, the, the aim essentially of trying that if there is any little bit of virus there in circulation, we will see it. So I like to explain it by apples or oranges. Let's use that as an example. And you are required to have by the end of the day, for your experiment, you went to school, you, the teacher told you, okay, Adana, you need to have, by the end of the day, you need to have 20 apples. But I only came to school with two apples. Now, I may need to do a lot of work or have lots of money to get, acquire those 20 apples by the end of the day. Whereas if it is that I had, for instance, let's say 10 apples to start, I'm halfway there and I may not need to spend as much money. So with the PCR, you have a heating and cooling cycle and it multiplies the number that you have. A heating and cooling cycle and it multiplies the number that you have. And that continues to happen until the instrument 
is able to read the peak or the signal that comes off that says, hey, I'm here. Apples, a whole set of apples, enough apples I've made criteria, I've made my 20 apples, I don't need to cycle any further. So for instance, a person who has a very low amount of virus in circulation, or we've gotten a very low amount of virus from the sample, we would have to go through a lot more of those cycles to get to 20 versus someone who had, let's say 10 in, to begin with, I may only have to go through one or two cycles before I get to 20. And so that is what we know as the cycle threshold. And that's what we're looking at. How many cycles did this sample had to go through or did this, this, this sample have to undertake in order for the instrument to be able to read it as a positive? Because we have a set number as what we consider positive. And so the more cycles that it has to go through, the less infectious the person is, or what we would call a higher CT value. And so that person is probably less infectious, whereas some person who only probably had to undertake 10 CTs or 15 CTs is someone who's extremely infectious, and they have a low CT value. Uh, I have another comment here. Uh, good evening, Dr. Grandison. I have thoroughly enjoyed this presentation. I think you have done an excellent job. My daughter wants to contact you. Sure, no problem. If a person already has COVID, why should they still be vaccinated? Wouldn't the vaccine be doing the same job as the actual disease? Creation of antibodies, easy identification of the disease if it comes back. Yes, so certainly if it is that a person has COVID, um, depending upon the extent of their virus that they have, they, they may have within circulation antibodies. Now before, remember I spoke about two types of antibodies, binding antibodies and neutralizing antibodies. Now at this point in time, we don't know because the majority of the tests that they have out there, the antibody, for instance, in the US, they have antibody kits. Um, these antibody kits do not differentiate between binding and neutralizing antibodies. Okay, and so at this point in time, we don't know uh, how, much, how much antibodies a person may have, especially neutralizing antibodies a person may have within circulation at a particular point in time. Not to mention the antibodies tend to wane after a certain time. Now there's a, within the adaptive arm of the immune system, and this is getting a bit more scientific now, we also have things like B and T cell response. And those are the guys who are there that are the, the ones that have the big memory banks that essentially remember what went before and can either send out troops essentially to kill them directly, make more troops to kill them or to make more antibodies. And that's, that's also something that is, is being um, investigated and researched at this point in time to really look at what is that B and T cell response that persons may have. But what we have seen so far is that whether it is a binding or a neutralizing antibody, that those antibody levels tend to drop off. And that is the reason even for some of the vaccines, why there has been the discussion of getting a booster shot. And this is not something new. For instance, we know that there are a few persons who have had, for instance, let's forget about COVID for a quick second. Persons have had their full three courses of hepatitis B, okay, which is required for most persons who are healthcare workers. And there are some persons who, when we do the titers for them, they still do not show that they have mounted enough immune response to consider them completely protected. And so we will give them another dose. I can tell you that I've had the personal experience of within healthcare, uh, doctors are required to get two shots of varicella. Uh, I got my two shots of varicella, which is chicken pox. And I was at the hospital and it's only when I was a medical student and I was essentially looking to go and do my elective overseas. And I got my titers for varicella. I recognized hmm, I hadn't mounted enough of a response against varicella. And so I had to go and get another Barcelona shot. And it's really just to ensure that you have sufficient antibodies in circulation that give you the requisite protection that you need. That's all a booster is. Can you please speak on the vaccines for children? So the Pfizer vaccine for kids essentially is the only one so far that has been approved for children. Um, it is given a lesser dosage and it has been considered to be safe for children and it's working the exact same way. Now, some persons may get concerned about things like the, uh, 
the, the myocarditis um, or the pericarditis that patients may have, which is uh, inflammation of either the heart muscle or the muscle or the sac around the actual heart. And that's in very, 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 very few cases. And that's from the international data. But this vaccine has been shown to be quite effective and quite safe for those populations. And a lot of persons will say, but so if it was so safe, why is that you did not uh, have it for children from the very beginning? And that's how all of our medications work. We generally allow for medications to be approved in the adult population because we tend to have more adults who are fit a normal profile. And we want to make sure that everything is very, very safe with the medication for them. And we know that generally adults tend to have a standard dose. And we see it quite often. If you go to the doctor, the doctor for most times with your oral medication won't go into a book or a calculator and start to calculate, okay, so John's weight is five kgs or 55 kgs so let's multiply his weight by the actual doses that we need to use and give him his exact dosage but we have to do that for kids right because we want to make sure that they are getting the correct amount of medication based upon their size based upon their development and so we need to ensure this this medication that we're giving although it lasts for a very short time in circulation uh we need to make sure that it does not affect the developing brain. These are some of the things that we get very concerned about and that it doesn't overwhelm the immune system. So the Pfizer vaccine as it stands right now is the only one that we tend to use in the child population. Whereas the Sinopharm vaccine is the one that is recommended for persons who are pregnant. And that is one of the, the sales, sales points essentially for the Sinopharm vaccine. But any person who is pregnant or has a child, and obviously depending upon the history of that child or pregnant woman, I would strongly suggest that you have a direct conversation with you, either the pediatrician for your child or your obstetrician for that pregnant female. Any other questions? Dr. Granderson, is it necessary to seek help early uh, or are home remedies effective? Uh, Barbies like to use a lot of home remedies. Are they effective? Like Vicks and Bush tea and all that stuff. So, yes. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, you tend to find that home remedies do have their place. I know we've come up in the space of Bush teas and vitamin C and Cersei Bush. All of these things are things that we've been using from the time or we've heard about granny using them um, way back in the day. But I would strongly suggest for two reasons, and I, I always tell persons this long before I, I was a doctor, I was a toxicologist. And one of the dangers of using bush teas and, and herbal remedies is really the fact that we don't know what dose we're giving ourselves. Every single leaf of, for instance, Moringa might not have in the same amount of Moringa. And certainly how Moringa, for instance, may affect you may not be how Moringa affects me. Um, also things like your Cersei bush and your Senna pods and all the other things that we tend to resort to to attempt to save us. I also want to remind you that the, most of the medication that's used within the pharmaceutical industry its basis is from a plant. A lot of persons don't know that. Um, so it's not that, you know, we have all these medications on the market and they, they're all these synthetic things. The majority of them actually come from plant source. However, what has occurred is that these medications or these chemicals have been studied. We now know exactly how they affect the body. Sometimes they can appear as what we know as isomers. So two sister, sister or twin molecule that has uh, various properties. So for instance, uh, one may give us all of the, the necessary or desired effects that we want, but it coexists quite nicely with one that actually does some really bad things. So what the pharmaceutical industry has attempted to do is not just to learn about how it appears in its natural state, but sometimes to separate the two of them to only give you the good one while actually moving or re removing the one that does not give you the desired side effects. 
And the reason that we do that is because then when we know the exact dose and the effects that it can have on the body, then we consider a lot safer. If we don't know what we're really using, how much we're taking in and how it will affect your body, then we have a challenge. You have to be vaccinated to travel. Uh, do you see a trend in the future beyond vaccines and beyond the viruses where it would be necessary to present, say, a safe key to show that you have been vaccinated and you have been swabbed and turned up to be negative on several occasions, as you see in other countries abroad? Um, currently, there are some countries, as you've stated, that require not just a uh, proof of vaccination, but also, if not one, um, several layers of PCR testing to ensure that uh, a visitor or traveler is safe to, to, to enter into gen pop circulation. Um, I, I think that every country has uh, will have its own rules and regulations in attempt to try to keep its population as safe as possible. Um, my only concern with having things like vaccine certificates or vaccine passports is that as we know with most things, persons who believe that they may be um, essentially ostracized because they have not conformed or have not become vaccinated may seek very uh, extreme measures in terms of potentially getting false vaccine certificates to an attempt to show that they have done what should be done. Um, so I think it's more important really to educate the population so that persons understand why they would be doing things. So I, I must say that having a session like this here where persons can get to ask any questions that they may have so that they can uh, clarify any misunderstandings that they have is actually um, a really good platform. And I think that that is probably one of the most effective ways of getting persons to the point where they vaccinate very readily and also test very readily to, to in attempt to try to reduce the possibility of carrying not just uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2 virus within your home population, but then carrying it abroad which then continues to perpetuate this whole thing of a pandemic where you're constantly seeing the virus popping back up in certain parts of the country or certain parts of the world, rather. I, what advice would you give people who have symptoms and they're not sure as to whether it's a common cold or flu or COVID, what advice would you give to them with regards to not going to the workspace? So certainly that's a very important question. So if it is that a person should get ill, first of all, they should not go to work. They should not send their child to school. They should seek medical attention in the form of getting a test. And for two reasons. One, you wanna know your status, but right now we all know that everybody is worried about COVID. And for instance, if it is that you have not confirmed that you have SARS-CoV-2, you will most likely worry about the fact, do I have SARS-CoV-2? These symptoms actually seem quite close to SARS-CoV-2. You think I may have it. And I think it is quite important, especially given the huge amount of stressors that we have during this very uncertain time, that we t try to eliminate as much as the uncertainty within this space. So I would first of all say, don't go to work. And then the next thing that I would say is to seek testing, go get that PCR test. In addition, I think it is important to cooperate uh, with the personnel, medical personnel, public health personnel to provide them with any possible contacts that you may have allow any persons that may have been close to you by phone, you don't need to physically go to them, but allow them to know by phone, hey, um, I'm having symptoms, I've tested positive, and I just want you to also be safe and I want you to get tested too. Now for those persons who are considered primary contacts, 
does it make sense to go and get tested immediately the day after you've been exposed? The answer to that is no, because you may not have enough virus particles in the back of your nose. So what do we ask that you do? We ask that you test five days later, where we know that you should have enough because it would have given that virus enough time to replicate and have even more of a viral load so that if you are it is present we will test you as being positive and then you can get the requisite treatment that you need but there's no need for instance to rush to go to to the gymnasium or to go to a polyclinic if you found out that today i earlier today i was around John Brown and John Brown just told me that he tested positive. So I'm going to the polyclinic to get tested. That's not necessary. But certainly if you've experienced any symptoms, yes, we'll seek testing. If you are a primary contact, we want you to seek testing five days later. I see a question here from Tony. Yes, Doc. I have another question and this one speaks to this issue of herd immunity. We understand that this herd immunity suggests that the higher percentage, some high percentage in the population being vaccinated seeks to protect the whole population as a whole. So um, the, 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 the whole benefits from what the majority does and, and 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 immunity is extended to those even though they have not been vaccinated but because there's such a small number the entire whole benefits is the reverse true that if the majority are unvaccinated do they pose a, a potential danger to the whole I think that's a, that's a great question, to be quite honest with you. Um, certainly, there is a role for herd immunity, but we know now with the COVID vaccine that herd immunity is a very, very difficult target to reach. Um, generally speaking, things over 70% with other uh, viruses and organisms historically, um, we have attempted to reach and have successfully reached um, in terms of eradicating things within our population, polio being one, right? Um, MMR, we generally tend to not see any MMR. And so the whole thought process of, of a herd, of the herd immunity concept is where many persons will have protection and those persons having the protection will protect the very small number of persons who, in, who are in population who may be unable for one reason or another to get the vaccine. It's not just the persons who have medical conditions. We have a lot of kids here in Barbados who are under the age of 12, right? They're also at risk. They get COVID too. They're not immune against COVID. But unfortunately, at this point in time, they can't get vaccinated. And so I think it is very important that those who can get vaccinated safely don't have any medical complaints that would prohibit them from getting vaccinated or certainly for religious reasons that they don't wish to get vaccinated. We respect your choices, but I strongly urge you to protect those around you and yourself um, because the converse, as you correctly said, does, does hold some truth to it. Um, the longer we stay in the space, uh, the more time the virus has to get it right. Um, remember, I spoke to you about this criminal whose sole purpose in life is to survive, to survive at all costs. If it means that it, it re requires to wear a hat, a raincoat, a shirt, and a pants to come out to survive another day, it will do that. If it requires that it needs to put on a bulletproof vest, a hat, then a, a, a bomb protection cap and, and look very silly, goggles, full works. It will do that because that is what it needs to survive. And it doesn't really care about how you may think it looks. 
uh, it will just do what it needs to do to survive because that is its primary goal, survive. Second goal, replicate. Whether that hurts you or not, not the virus's issue, right? So I say to you that the longer we have persons who are potentially uh, infected uh, or are not vaccinated can expose persons to the actual virus, and those persons can certainly um, then allow for the virus to continue to mutate and infect other persons. And the, the concern really is that it may not happen tomorrow, may not happen next month, may happen a few months from now, but the concern really is suppose we end up getting a variant that is not um, just of concern, but of significant concern because not only does it, is it more transmissible or not only does it cause uh, worse outcomes, but it then overwhelms our uh, healthcare system uh, on an international basis. And that is the one thing we really don't want. Well, I'm glad I said, I am minded of two, two uh, things, one from There are two opinions, one from Rosemary Antoine and one from Sir Dennis Byron, from the, the former president of the CCJ, who says that mandatory vaccinations are not um, unlawful. They do not affect constitutional rights during this, this time. I am thinking the time may come where there is no herd immunity and the virus gets very extreme that essential workers may have to be vaccinated. What do you think about that personally? Uh, personally, um, we certainly want to give persons first the choice to vaccinate. So that is why I think it is important to have um, settings like this where any misunderstandings or, or any challenges that you may have in terms of misconceptions about the vaccine really uh, need to take center stage so that those could be stamped out and answered. That would allow you to make an informed decision. Um, but I, I do believe that the same way uh, we are asking, for instance, patients to come into a facility and we know their status so that we know exactly how to treat them, that certainly there is also, this is me speaking personally now, um, not in any capacity, um, that there is also a duty of us to our patient population to ensure that we treat them as safely as possible. And if you are not going to vaccinate, I again recommend that um, that person should at least know what their status is to, to allow for everyone in the space to feel comfortable. So I think there's a duty on behalf of the patient to the healthcare professional. And then there's also a duty um, to the health from the healthcare professional to that patient. I think that's very important. I see another question here. What are persons who are awaiting testing and are still going to work, supermarkets, et cetera? Is there enough public awareness about the danger of doing this? Um, um, I am hoping that certainly this, this type of forum and other forums, I know that there's actually um, another um, presentation actively going on right now as we speak um, in another church setting. Speaking about the same COVID-19, and I think that healthcare professionals are really trying to get out there and educate the public because there is a danger um, in exposing unnecessarily your colleagues. Um, I don't think it should be an opportunity to say, well, I think I got exposed so I can take four or five days home. Um, but certainly if you are a primary contact and established primary contact, you have been in contact with a person and this is within contact of a person for at least 15 minutes. You may or may not have, have on a mask. And there are varying percentages for the risks associated with being in a space for a person in a room that doesn't have good ventilation for greater than 15 minutes with and without your face mask. So ideally, what do we want? 
we want that you try to limit all of those long contacts with persons. If you are going to be in that room, that the room has an adequate ventilation, that the persons are six feet apart, um, that for instance, that you have on a mask. If you are going to be in that room and you're going to be in close quarters with that person, just in an attempt to try to minimize the amount of risk that you would be passing on to some person. Should you become a primary contact, then what do you do? As I said, you need to first notify your, your office, your, your job, hey, I'm a primary contact, and, um, and don't, don't go to work. And certainly, especially if you are symptomatic, do not go to work. Do not infect other people. Do not take the public transportation and, and cause a, a challenge to other persons. Don't do it. You're, you're not only hurting yourself, pretending that you can superwoman or superman it through the day, but more importantly, you're also infecting another person. So I'm going to say, don't do it. You're welcome. Any other questions? What impact do you think uh, community spread would have on the education system, uh, the economy, and uh, the well being of Barbadians in general. Uh, how can people seek to arrest uh, community spread? So at this point in time, I think the horse has already left the stable in Barbados as it relates to, to community spread, if I may be quite honest, because we do have community spread here. Um, that has been established. And what is really community spread? Anytime that we have cases that are presented where we are unable to trace where that case came from, essentially we have community spread. Um, we, we would look from a public health standpoint, they may look at a certain amount of numbers of those cases before they define it as such. Um, but in very rough, harsh terms, that's, that's really what it is. And I think that um, the only way for us to, to essentially uh, try to reduce the amount of persons that we have within community that will continue to potentially spread the virus is to disrupt the spread. Um, within uh, my podcast settings, I always like to use the analogy of the matches. If you have 20 matches in a line and you light one side of the, mat the, the, the set of matches in the line, even if you only light one of them, once they're close enough, they will all burn. Um, however, if we have 20 matches in a line and I light one at the end and I remove one so that the distance for the fire to jump is a little further, I have essentially stopped the entire set of matches from burning down. And that is what we really, really, really need to do at this point in time. So remove persons from society, from community, who as early as possible, who have the potential to infect persons and then uh, go on to essentially try to keep them as safe as possible uh, to get them back into society as quickly as possible, but we need, we need to disrupt that spread. And the only way to do that is to remove uh, infected persons from within the community. I see a question here, I see a hand up. Yes, Doc. Um, the, 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 the issue that perplexes me and causes me concern all the time is we have had pandemics before had um, the Spanish flu, but in, certainly in my lifetime, I have not seen anything that has impacted the world in such a complete way, um, where all the different systems that make for life to continue in what is considered normal have been so disrupted and 
what, what, what does this mean for the future from a medical standpoint? Are we going to get more of this in the future? Um, are the scientists seeing potentially a, a, another pandemic around the corner? And, and if so, what are the lessons that have been learned? Are, are we more, will we be, be more prepared? That's a, that's a big, heavy question there that you've asked. Um, but thanks a lot for the question. Um, I, I don't know that we, we can predict when, unfortunately, the next pandemic would occur, especially in situations where we have um, nature taking its own course, right? Um, if we have, and certainly if we have a naive virus um, coming into a space where persons have never been primed or exposed to that, that virus, um, it can potentially happen all over again. Um, especially now with the ease of travel going from one continent to another. Um, so I think what we need to really return to is the tenets of good things like good respiratory hygiene, um, hand washing. You know, these tenets are things that are critical, I think, in terms of disrupting spread. Um, quite often here, uh, I, I would see prior to COVID, you know, persons would sneeze and wouldn't use a tissue to cover their mouths or they may not even sneeze into their elbow. And I think it's really time that we become more accountable to each other um, and certainly uh, practice proper respiratory hygiene. Um, if it is that you need to sneeze or you need to cough, either sneeze or cough into a tissue or cough into your, or sneeze into your elbow. And if for whatever reason, let's say you didn't have a tissue, couldn't get to the elbow quick enough and you could only use your hands and your hands become sprayed with some of those droplets, then absolutely immediately you want to go to the restroom and wash your hands and, and not just do a, a two seconds wash around like what we generally tend to see. We want you to lather the insides of the hands, lather the outsides of the hands. Then we want you to lather by the knuckles, right? Make sure you get all by the knuckles, the thumb, all right? The blade of the hand, knuckles, the other side, bloody hand, the center of the hand, because we tend to get lots of bacteria in the palms of the hand and the wrist. Persons within the healthcare and also in the hospitality, then they extend all the way up to the, to the actual elbow. Um, these are things that we want to encourage you to do to practice quite often to keep not just yourself safe, but keep everyone safe. But to answer the question of if there's going to be a pandemic around the corner, I'm not so sure that I, I hold that answer. I have not seen discussions, but I think that this one really has, has taken, um, has really made an impact, not just on the healthcare around the world and allow us to know how important life is and sort of put things in perspective, I think it also allowed persons initially to really pause and take stock, really focus on what is important, going back to taking care of yourself, um, you know, ensuring that you get in your exercise, ensure that you get your requisite rest, ensure that not you socially distance, but you physically distance during this point in time, but still check in on that person, phone a friend and ask them, how are you doing? These are the things that are really important for us as social beings. And I think that it, it, we really, really need to, to normalize and focus on, on that if we plan to ever keep ourselves safe for anything going forward. So do you think that the, the COVID epidemic has adversely affected the mental health of um, some people. Do, they, do you, from your experience as a practitioner, uh, or from your observation of community, do you see people presenting with uh, signs of mental distress or anxiety, et cetera? So absolutely. Um, this pandemic has already caused persons to to really um, become distressed um, during any tragic event. Let me think about um, psychological first aid. After any significant or stressful event, 
there will be the majority of persons who will remain euphoric. They will understand what's happening and it wouldn't really bother them. They're, they're able to adapt, to change, to get on with life per se. But then we have some persons who are stressed, you know, they're, I don't know where I'm probably gonna get my next meal. Um, you know, I don't know when my kids are gonna to get to go back to school and socialize. How am I gonna get a break from my children? Um, how am I gonna pay this month's rent? But then sometimes with a bit of education, like these sessions or talking to someone, they can sort of see through, they, they get a plan and they, they are able to then adapt. You know, they get taught to a healthcare provider, whether it's a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a general practitioner, and, and they're able to move forward with a plan, a short-term goal, and then a long-term goal. And then there are persons who become extremely distressed and, and are, are unable to, to function. And sometimes those persons not only require things like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a big fancy word for talk therapy, um, where you essentially talk it up with someone, but sometimes we also require to provide that person with a bit of pharmacological intervention. So yes, I will state that I have seen significant amounts of anxiety presenting now during this time. Um, I have also seen depression uh, presenting during this time. And it's certainly because it is a time of uncertainty. Persons really don't know what next. Every single time, I think Barbadians had it, uh, when I saw the surge of cases coming in, if I could say that, um, with mental health challenges, was well, certainly after the eruption of La Soufrère. Um, it was almost as if, you know, we had the lockdown, um, we were sort of getting some of the measures lifted and it was almost as if mother nature said, I told you do not go outside. I told you to stay inside, stay safe and you're not listening to me, bam, La Soufrère erupted. And we were all forced to stay inside. It got worse because previously with COVID, at least you could open your windows, but we went through close to a week of really not being able, sometimes for some people even more, of not being able to open their windows, not getting fresh air, not getting sunshine. Every single time they go, they have to put on a mask. They couldn't go into a space where there was no one around. I feel safe, okay, I can take off my mask. Every single time they left the house, they had to put on their mask. Every single time they looked around, there was lots of dust in the house. All of these things that, you know, we think are quite insignificant or small events, they actually cumulatively can have a very significant impact on people's lives. So you may be accustomed to, for instance, sweeping or vacuuming your house every single day, once at least every single day or every other day or once a week. But with the ash fall, you know how to sweep or vacuum your house four or five times a day. And that's quite distressing because you had that time carved out for other things. And, and so we saw that and then after the ash fall, uh, then we said, okay, good, we get to go back outside, we outside, and then bam, Elsa came, and again, <laughs> we had to return to inside, some persons had electricity, water disruptions, and these are all certainly significant events that can potentially also cause an impact on the spread of COVID, if you're thinking about a hurricane, uh, if you have disruption of services, utilities, these types of things, it then promotes more commingling. Um, we have seen this here, for instance, in Jamaica. Jamaica has now had more cases after their hurricanes because persons have to go into shelters and, and get help and this type of stuff. And with that comes the increased possibility of, of exposure and the increased possibility of getting infected. So these are some things that I think that we need to look at. But yes, I have seen more cases of anxiety and distress presenting where persons are feeling uh, quite overwhelmed at this point in time. And I think it is important that one, during this period of time to check in, as I said, on a friend, but call it if you notice that a friend appears overwhelmed, even within the healthcare space, um, call it, say, hey, I, I noticed that you are not yourself recently. Is, is there anything that I can do to help or at least some person that I can direct you to that I think may be able to help you? Because we are all here in it together and to the extent where possible, we want to try to help each other out.
I'm not seeing any other questions. Dr. Grandison, young people that have come across in juvenile court and elsewhere, they have been saying that virtual learning is posing a problem for them. Uh, they, there is so much uh, involved in virtual learning because of the COVID epidemic that uh, some of them are not coping well. What would you suggest to parents and are the ADs young people who are not coping well with virtual learning? Well, first of all, I think it is quite important that, and this is beyond COVID, um, any learner should really, should know, or their parents should know their learning style. That's the first thing. And I think we really need to be able to, to understand the needs of each and every single child. Um, parents need to really know how their child best learns. But more importantly, because children require socialization, um, and not in the sense of going out and partying, but just being around some person, getting to understand what is socially acceptable and normal. Um, I can understand the challenge for some of them uh, where they're unable to have that uh, social stimulation that they need for that's quite critical for development. And so I think we need to come with novel ways. Um, I know that the tweens and the teens are a little bit more difficult to manage, um, but more family activity where possible. And it doesn't have to be something that costs. It can be something as simple as going to the beach um, as a family or taking an evening walk or taking a morning walk doing activities in a group, if you have board games at home, um, sitting down as a family and getting back to playing old school board games. These are so many things that, not, uh, believe it or not, won't only help the children in the household, may actually help the adults in the household to, to get a laugh and to get back that competitive spirit to, to really help each other out during this time. So I think that, um, that one, we need to provide uh, of new and novel ways of stimulating the brain and activities, whether you may ask a child to assist with a little bit of gardening in the, in the kitchen garden that you've created and getting them out there and teaching them a thing or two about gardening as you go. Um, and also spend a little bit more time with them, if possible, in terms of what needs to be done from a homework perspective. I know that this, this time has been quite difficult for persons because uh, before we had lots of boundaries we may not have imposed those boundaries on ourselves, but we end up having them because we would leave home at a certain time. We would get to work at a certain time. We would have to eat breakfast at a certain time. All of these things we would do to ensure that we are staying on target in terms of getting through our work day. Now, a lot of us are getting up. We go into a meeting. We haven't had breakfast. We haven't had a shower. You know, you have your virtual background, you know, you put on the, Zoom actually allows you to put on lipstick and and uh, makeup. And I actually had to tell my sister as, as recent as uh, yesterday, I said, you know, Zoom actually does all this stuff for you um, because persons don't set boundaries anymore for themselves. And so your day feels as if it goes on for extremely long and you feel almost as if there's just so much to do in the same 24 hour period. Um, so the first thing that I would suggest, not just for the children, but also for the adults, is set back those boundaries to gain some uh, healthy family activity. And then we also need to look at the responsibilities of ourselves as a community in terms of also trying to assist those kids in getting back into school as quickly as possible, but most importantly, as safely as possible. Is there any such thing, Dr. Grandison, as COVID tiredness? Um, it's now 18 months since, or more since the epidemic. And people are saying that they're tired of, of, of the curfews and tired of having to have a regime that they're not accustomed to. What are the things you would suggest to assist people to cope? The tiredness. Yes, so um, in terms of COVID fatigue, yeah, there is COVID fatigue. 
Um, it's also been documented, not from a health standpoint, but from an economic standpoint, um, something called the Peltzman effect that we've, we've seen quite often. And even with the with vaccines now in the space, persons are like, okay, well, they've offered vaccines. Some persons have taken vaccines, so I could sort of chill out. I don't need to be as rigid as before. I don't need to to do as much as I was doing. I don't need to wear my mask properly. I don't need to, to social distance. I could I could just go by the bar and just have a few drinks with the boys, you know, even if we close. We only close for a day. It's not really going to be too much of a hassle but but remember with that that short lapse even if it is a short lapse there's always the possibility that there is that serial killer right around the corner who is not going to lapse and and i think that during those times we need to remember that there is that serial killer around the corner who continues to watch who continues to attack who continues to to you know try to melt or, or hurt us in some way. Um, but what can we do? Um, we need to, to get back. First of all, I would say strongly self-care. Um, eat properly, have boundaries, get rest. Um, sometimes that healthcare professionals, we don't quite understand. I will be the first to put up my hand to say that, you know, I, I have not gotten as much rest as I used to get or as I'm accustomed to getting. Um, but there are some times that you have to say, okay, enough is enough. Um, today is a day for me. I'm going to get rest today. I'm going to take a time out. And it's important to, to have that time. Turn back to spirituality. If you're a spiritual person or a religious person, um, go back to the church. If you're not religious, if you are into meditation, yoga, whatever you're into, then you need to do that to take care of yourself. And remember, just like what they say on any plane, the only time that you can really assist anyone best is if you yourself are you, you're best taken care of. So start out your oxygen mask first, okay? Before you attempt to assist anyone with a face mask. Um, so I would say definitely self-care is important. Talk to, if you feel overwhelmed, talk to a healthcare professional, reach out to your polyclinic nurse, someone, um, letting them know, you know, I don't think I'm coping so well. And, and don't be embarrassed to say I'm not coping. You know, it, it is okay to not cope sometimes um, so that we can get the help and, and the instruction and the guidance in terms of how to cope. A lot of persons within the Caribbean um, see uh, psychological assistance and psychiatric assistance in terms of a psychiatrist or a psychologist as being something that should be taboo and it really, really isn't. Um, but it, it really is something to be normalized. Go sit down, have that conversation, talk to someone. If you require psychiatric intervention, know that it is actually for your best, um, but don't be afraid to do it certainly do not um, shy away or, or what we would call persons then are lost to care because they're embarrassed about it. Don't do that because doctors are here to help you. Nurses are here to help you. Healthcare workers are here to help you. And I think at this point in time, it's really also about providing each other with as much grace as possible. This is a very difficult time for persons. Um, this is a time that's very uncertain. And I think that the only way for us to get through this um, together is really to communicate with one another, try to be as nice as possible to each other, and we will get through this. If, if today I carry 80% of the load because you are only able to carry 20, then there may be a day that I may be only able to carry 20 and you may be able to pick up the other 80. So I think it's really being essentially our brother's keeper. Dr. Grandison, on behalf of St. Clements and St. Swithin's Church, churches in St. Lucie, and all our listeners, all of the listeners, and all the participants in today's uh, presentation on vaccine variants and beyond, I want to thank you for your very clear uh, presentation without the use of polysyllabic words. Uh, quite easy to understand from the youngest to the oldest in our community. And we want to thank you uh, for your presentation and hope that uh, we can all glean something 
in terms of protecting ourselves from this vicious uh, virus. Uh, if you have any nuggets for the public, uh, for your audience, before you go, what would you say? If you can sum it up, what would you say? I want to say, first of all, thank you for having me. I completely enjoyed um, this presentation this evening. I am always happy once time provides or allows um, to, to give these types of talks because I really enjoy educating persons. I think that it's really important for persons to be educated about medical topics because that's what helps persons to make the best possible um, medical decisions um, along the way. I also want to say um, in terms of take home points, First of all, practice proper hand hygiene, wash your hands. Whether you can use soap or wa and water, or if you're unable to use soap and water, certainly use hand sanitizer. Second thing, practice proper respiratory hygiene. Gone should be the days of coughing and sneezing out into public, okay, without covering your mouth or your nose. Um, Certainly wear a mask, but not just wear a mask, wear it properly, right? Uh, we don't need any surfing masses below the chins or below the nose um, that can potentially put you at risk. And I want to say for those of you who can get vaccinated, by all means, please do get vaccinated. If you are unsure, you're unclear about something, you have questions, at someone who's knowledgeable in the space that can guide you, provide you with the evidence. Our job is not to say, go get vaccinated or, or beat you on the head about getting vaccinated, but really to provide you with the information that you need to make an informed decision. And I just wanna encourage you, I hope that this information certainly has been beneficial, that will allow you to make the, the right choice, not just for yourself, but, but for your household for the persons in your immediate community, for the persons in your distant community in Barbados, and, and certainly the, the worldwide impact that it can have because this is affecting all of us. And take time for yourself, it's important. Um, know when to say no, <laughs> know when to take some downtime, when to get rest, to eat properly. I mean, yes, we can have vaccines, we can do all the things from a non pharma logical standpoint but if we are not eating properly and when I say eating properly not just getting in three squares and it could be three squares of chicken and chips but actually getting in all of your proper food groups eating your vegetables getting in your water not eating that that high content sugary food but eating well um, to make sure that you have a very nutrition dense diet meal to make sure that you're giving your body every single thing that it needs to do all that it needs to do and and let's try to work together to to get back to as our new normal or as normal as we possibly can have where we we don't have as much economic or as much healthcare fallout as as we're experiencing right now those are my nuggets to take home Good night, everyone. To you as well. God bless. Be safe.